Welcome to this. This will be the seventh talk on uh, the sequence from the Brahma Viharas to the Satipatthanas, the four celestial abidings and the four resting places of awareness. And just to remember what these four resting places of awareness are. The four Satipatthanas that the Buddha called were what the Buddha called wise awareness, Samma Sati. And this wise awareness is not so much a practice as we've seen many times, because the practice is about right effort. The practice is about wise practice, samma vayamo. And this wise awareness is a result that happens through wise practice. And what is this wise practice? It is simply to know when the mind is distracted to know when unwholesome states arise, like anger or wanting something that is not here now in our meditation. It can also be uh, wanting a good meditation. Wanting Nibbana is the first thing that will keep us from experiencing Nibbana. And perhaps it's anger Perhaps it's something that happened during the day. And to let go of these unwholesome states and to cultivate wholesome, uplifted, elevated states of mind. And that is also where the Satipatthana has come into play. And so, by abandoning unwholesome states, for example, example agitation, or a scattered mind. We simply relax, we let go of that tension in the mind. And what happens at that time, as soon as we use discernment, panya, to see the mental states, when there is mental agitation, for example, we see this with wisdom and we let go of it. Now it is the nature of a scattered mind to be scattered. And it is the nature of the mind that lets go of agitation to become calm and to become happy, to become steady. And the more we practice in this way, we can also bring up one of the Brahma Viharas, love, joy, compassion, or radiant calm. And this will uplift the mind. These are wholesome states that we use to bring up. It is the nature of a loving mind to be caring, to be attentive, to be mindful. And that is very important to understand. Why is it so important is that sometimes people tend to be very serious practicing the Satipatthanas. They become very uh, focused <laughs> on these things, either one of these things. And that is not necessarily the way. In fact, the four resting places of awareness, they are there all the time, continually. But there are hindrances pulling us out of it, drawing us away from seeing things clearly as they really are. And these are these four foundations of mindfulness. At the very, very, very bottom of our experience, if the mind was completely, completely clear, we would only see these things the way they are, yata bhutan, without without distortion, without fog, without 
uh, mental haziness, they would be very clear. Seeing whatever sensation that arises as simply what it is, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. But there would not be a judgment, an opinion, an expectation that is labeled, stapled over that experience. Same for the body, seeing body as body. When we let go of judgments, opinions, and expectations, we simply can rest awareness clearly with simply body. And there is great joy in this because this is a mind that is very clear, very uplifted. It is not about focusing the mind on these things, it's about resting it on it because it is the natural resting place of the mind. That is why they are so wholesome, is that we don't actually need to do anything about it. They are just there. And so, as we've explored the body, and in the first sutta of the, that I explained the Buddhist path and how we taught awareness of the body with the similes, the similes of uh, the soap maker that would be kneading the soap powder. And this is uh, a simile for an analogy for the joy within the body. And see here, the joy is very present in this practice. He said to fill, to drench, to suffuse, to pervade, to permeate the whole body with joy the blissful joy of letting go at first, as we let go, let go, and enjoy the bliss of release, because it comes with a lot of joy. And the joyful mind is a mind that is aware. It is here, present. It is not flowing outwards anymore. It is fully content. And that is the kind of mind that we are trying to develop. Then he used the simile of the lake, the lake that had this well, welling up from within, that cool spring, because that lake was not fed by any other sources, all the senses, but it was fed from bhavana, mental development, the inner bliss of mental cultivation. And that lake would be suffused by this cool water. That is the joy suffusing the whole body. And then he used the simile of the lotuses for the ease in the body, the joyful ease in the body, where these lotuses, some of them are born in the water. They do not go above the surface of the water. And so everywhere they are touched by this cool water, everywhere. And so it is the same thing with this blissful ease with the body of the third level of meditation, where the mind is very collected and it starts to become very steady and calm and there is this clear awareness of body and it is very happy, very joyful. And the last simile was a simile of the cloth. Like a, a person would have this beautiful white cloth, sparkling, shining, all over their body, so that no, no part of their body would not be touched by this cloth, this pure, sparkling white cloth. And that is compared to the spotless purity of our own minds in the fourth jhana. And the awareness of the body becomes very crisp, becomes HD. <laughs> but we don't have to do anything about it. In fact, we only let go and relax and bring joy. And that joy will suffuse the body. And that joy is that very thing that will steady the mind. And when we understand this, we understand the proper way of practicing with the four foundations of mindfulness. 
Now, without further ado, <laughs> I invite you to simply relax and sit into any comfortable position that is best suited for you. And just smile. Doesn't matter what happened today, if you have worries, anxieties, sadness, restlessness, whatever it is, just let it go and smile. Notice how good it feels to let go any tension in the body, whether it's in your neck or your shoulders, maybe somewhere along your spine, your legs or your feet. And just be happy here now. Perhaps you might notice your whole body. You might notice that as you relax, let go. unclench, unlatch any ideas or any tension in your body. As you give it up, Awareness naturally through letting go and smiling it starts to grow and it grows clearer
And this is not something we can force or push or control. In fact, this is something that we can only access by letting go. Relaxing. And actually enjoying this process. And as you smile, perhaps now you feel that smile shining in your whole body. We're not looking for a big Hollywood style bells and whistles kind of joy with no fireworks, no big explosions, just this joy that you feel that comes from letting go and smiling. Maybe even laughing a little bit at your own mind if it is very restless. Thinking, look at this mind. It's crazy. No need to take it so personal. The truth is that We do not ask the mind to be distracted, it simply is. And if we tell it to stop, it doesn't really listen. And so the only way is to actually let go, smile, and not take it so personally. It's just the monkey mind doing its thing, jumping from one branch to another. Maybe it's been doing this all day. Maybe it needs to have some time so that it realizes that it can calm down now. Maybe climb down from the tree.
and take a step back. Now perhaps the monkey mind can simply see all of those branches. That it could grasp, it could seize. And it could go from that branch to that other branch to that other branch. Maybe sometimes it starts doing it automatically. Or we just let go, relax and smile. If the mind comes up with something that it wants to do, something that is coming, starts thinking about it. Simply noticing that, letting it go. smiling And coming back to this awareness of body. Maybe the mind brings up something that it doesn't like. It's thinking about tomorrow, something that has to be done and that isn't particularly enjoyable. And it starts creating friction around that idea, simply noticing it. There is dislike at that point. We let go. Smile, relax. And 
maybe the monkey mind is saying, why, I, why am I doing this? What is this practice? My mind isn't calming down. Smile. Relax. Let go. This is only doubt. And it is troubling the mind. The common denominator in the four resting places of awareness is letting go. And smiling. It is not clinging. not holding on to any particular aspect of this experience, but to let go, relax, and smile. and to know as it is the state of the mind. If it is distracted, fine, it is distracted. We still let go and smile and relax. not trying to control not indulging being fooled by these hindrances and starting indulging in them we simply take a step back we smile Relax. If the mind is dull, the mind is dull. We smile, relax, let go of the dullness.
Now the mind be, the mind may be expansive. Perhaps we have let go of the hindrances to a point where it feels fairly unconstricted. It is very joyful, free, open. Mahagata. Gone great. We simply know this as it is. If it is not, it is not. Perhaps awareness of the body is fairly faded in the background. Perhaps there is simply joy in this awareness, crisp awareness of mind. Sa Uttara, a surpassed mind. And if it is not, it is not. It is fine. If the mind is collected, we simply know it to be collected. If it is not collected, we simply know it is not collected. And the practice is the same. We smile, we let go. Any little tension that arises any disturbance, any distractions. Whether you're aware of the body as a whole, whether you're aware of sensations, whether you're aware of the general state of the mind, the practice is the same.
as long as we never forget to enjoy enjoy the release smile the fourth awakening factor joy a factor of the first jhana a factor of the second jhana factor of the third jhana joy and happiness This is very, very important. This will keep our awareness sharp, discerning. Sabe satta sabe panna sabe bhuta sabe pugala Sabe atabhava pariyapanna Sabe tiyo sabe purisa Sabe ariya sabe anariya Sabe deva sabe manusa sabe vini patika. Awe rauntu abhyapha jauntu. Aniga huntu sukhiyata nang pariyarantu. Dukha muchantu yathalada sampatitho mawe gachantu kamasaka. Purati maya disaya pachi maya disaya Uttaraya disaya dakhinaya disaya Purati maya nudisaya pachi maya nudisaya Uttaraya nudisaya dakhinaya nudisaya Sabhe satta sabhe panna sabhe bhuta sabhe pugala Sabhe atabhava pariyapanna Sabhe itiyo sabhe purisa Sabhe ariya sabhe anariya Sabhe deva sabhe manusa sabhe vinipatika Aweraun tu abhyaphe jauntu 
Aniga hondu sukhi atthanang pariharanthu Dukkha muchantu yathalada sampatitho Mauigachantu kammasaka Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya buddhang pujemi Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya dhammang pujemi Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya sanghang pujemi Adhai maya pati padaya jati jara pyadi maranangha parimuchi sami Idang me punyang asawa kayang waham hotu. Idang te punyang nibbana sapache hotu. Nama punya bagang sabhasatanang bajimi. Te sabhe me samang punya bagang labantu sa. And bringing this feeling of boundless love within our hearts for a few moments. For all living beings. With a smile. I invite you to incline your bright minds towards listening to the Dhamma. And tonight I will be talking about this sutta that is called the Sankhitta Sutta. Sankhitta means uh, short or concise instruction. And it is this monk that comes and goes to the Buddha and asks uh, for guidance. And he says, for my own good, Bhante, could the awakened one teach me the Dhamma concisely? Perhaps having heard the awakened one's words, I could dwell alone, secluded, attentive, intent, and resolute. And these are all words that uh, describe meditation. There were many words used at the time of the Buddha to uh, talk about meditation. Not just we use the word meditation, but for example, seclusion for them often meant meditation. Or uh, dwelling uh, intent, fully aware and resolute is also a sentence they would say by meaning that they would be meditating. And so there are all these interesting uh, ways of looking at this practice. And he says, uh, Teach me, O Bhante, the Dhamma of the Awakened One, concisely. Teach me, O Happy One, Sugata, the Dhamma, concisely. Hopefully, listening to the words of the Awakened One, I can understand the meaning, hopefully keeping it in mind, keeping in mind the Wakeful One's advice, I can be an hear of the Dhamma. That means uh, any of the stages of awakening, but especially final awakening, Arahatship. In this case, monk, you should train in this way. And here I choose this sutta here tonight because it is the template 
that I have been using to uh, guide you along on this journey from the Brahma Viharas to the Satipatthanas, to the boundless uh, virtuous emotions, virtuous, wholesome, abidings of the heart and the mind to these four resting places of our awareness. And here the Buddha, it is one of these wonderful discourses where the Buddha summarizes in a very concise way a very long, <laughs> that could be a very long teaching, <laughs> but he makes it very nice and short and very understandable, very intelligible. And uh, we can very easily take this and use it and practice it. And this is the template that I've been using in these past six sessions. So you can know or understand where I'm coming from with this. I will develop a mind that is still and well established within. An existing harmful, unwholesome states of mind will not take over and settle. Now this simply means that we are taking some time to viveka, uh, to let go. To, we, the first step of meditation, the first factor of jhana is viviche wa kamehi. And that means Vivicca is letting go, letting go of all these things that we could be doing right now, or all these engagements of the mind towards all these objects outwardly. We just let it go. That is the first step. And that is what is meant here. We just prepare the mind. We just let it go. We relax. We bring up a smile. We're happy here and now. From there, monk, when the mind is still and well established within, of course now the still mind here, it can be a little bit agitated still, but we mainly, this, this stillness that is meant here is more the stillness of purposefully letting go of all these outside distractions and at least trying to be here and now. This is not the ultimate stillness, <laughs> the beginning stillness. When the mind is still and well established within, an existing harmful, unwholesome states of mind do not take over and settle, which means we're let, letting go enough so that we have enough mental clarity, just a little bit, by smiling. We remember this sequence that the Buddha said when we let go, when we uh, relax, the mind becomes joyful and that joy is what makes the mind collected. So once we start practicing a little bit like this, we can, uh, we have the foundation, the proper foundation to begin the groundwork for our meditation. Then you should train in this way I will develop and cultivate the release of mind by boundless love. Make it a vehicle, make it a foundation, practice it, accumulate it, and undertake it thoroughly. And see here, this is quite a wonderful sequence where the Buddha, in fact, um, it is fairly hard to find in the original text, in the original words of the Buddha, uh, one word that means a, an object of meditation. This is something that came later on. And here we find that he mostly uses the words, make it a vehicle, make it a foundation, practice it, accumulate it, and undertake it thoroughly. So that is how he taught to practice these things. And this is very in line with Bhavana, his teaching on mental development. This is not how to fix the mind on something. This is how to liberate the mind. This is how to uplift, elevate, and purify the mind. 
And so we make this boundless love our vehicle. We make this boundless love a foundation in our lives. And we practice it constantly. And we undertake it all the time. So that's what he said. This is how you should train, monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination or reflection. Without thinking, but with imagination. Without thinking nor imagination. See how here he uses another way to describe the first two jhanas, the first two levels of meditation, but simply in a different way this time. And he explains very clearly, as we saw in the previous talk also, the nun's residence, where there is this clear distinction between using an uplifting recollection, an uplifting object, this uh, to uplift the mind, but then when the mind is uplifted, we don't need that object anymore. Then it gets in the way, and then we let it go. And so the mind can go deeper, deeper into calm, deeper into the meditation. And so here this thinking and imagination can be a friend, it can be a person, it can be a place in nature, it can be an animal, <laughs> it can be many things. And when this recollection, for example, thinking of this young kitten or this baby goat that is just really uplifting your mind because it is very cute and you feel a lot of love for it, but then if you keep bringing it up into your mind and uh, not understand that the important part of this meditation is the feeling, not so much the image in the mind, then we create tension and that is a hindrance in later stages of meditation. So we let that go and we remain with the uplifted feeling of love for all living beings then. Then without thinking but with imagination, this is more, uh, less like active thinking but more like uh, a vague, uh, maybe perhaps more like an image or something. And even that image, he says here, the next step is to let that go. It is to cultivate that without thinking nor imagination so that means simply that boundless feeling. Then he says, to cultivate it with joy, then beyond joy or without joy, with constant delight and constant calm. And so here, this is another way of pointing at the four jhanas, but in a very concise way. And see here how the word joy and delight come as very clear. There is joy and there is happiness and there is enjoying and delight in this kind of meditation. It is very important. And that calm, which is usually translated, this is upeka, this is usually translated as equanimity but this is very often misunderstood. It is not an equanimity that, for example, I would say uh, uh, to not move and to sit through very long sittings with a lot of pain and remaining equanimous to it. That's not the equanimous, <laughs> that's not the equanimity that is talked about here. The equanimity that is talked about here is through wise meditation, through wise development of the mind. And it only happens when we let go and bring up wholesome states. And that is joy also. Upekka comes from upa ishka, which means on looking. 
I like to call it steadiness of mind. And here this is the steadiness of mind that happens by mental development, by bringing up joy or any of the Brahma Viharas to uplift the mind and to let go of any kind of hindrance. And as we do this naturally, the mind becomes very steady. So it is not a forced equanimity. It is a developed, joyful calm of mind. At that time when this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train yourself. I will develop and cultivate the release of mind by boundless compassion. Make it a vehicle, make it a foundation, practice it, accumulate it and undertake it thoroughly. This is how you should train monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination. Without thinking, but with imagination. Without thinking, nor imagination. With joy, then beyond joy. With constant delight, then with, with constant calm or steadiness. When this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train. I will develop and cultivate the release of mind by boundless joy. Make it a vehicle, make it a foundation, practice it, accumulate it and undertake it thoroughly. This is how you should train monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination. Without thinking, but with imagination. Without thinking, nor imagination. With joy, beyond joy. With constant delight, with constant calm. When this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train. I will develop and cultivate the release of mind by boundless calm or steadiness of mind. Make it a vehicle, make it a foundation, practice it, accumulate it and undertake it thoroughly. This is how you should train monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination without thinking but with imagination, without thinking nor imagination, with joy, without joy, with constant delight, with constant calm. And here we see there is or there can be a gradual practice or progression through the Brahma Viharas in this way, but he also explains because we go from a coarser emotion, which is very wonderful, but this love is stronger. This compassion is a little bit more detached. It has this tinge of now there is, when we have compassion, it is because there is something unpleasant happening, whether it's for us or whether it's for somebody else. But the compassion implies that there is this unpleasantness that comes into the experience. So compassion is a bit more detached because nobody grasps at that unpleasantness but we can still bring up this wholesome feeling of compassion for someone else, for us, for a situation. Then joy is quite lighter quite easier. Joy is very simple and so it, it is a bit more subtle and it can, it, it is better developed very often in this way, in this boundless way, when the mind is a little bit calmer so that we can actually understand and do it properly. It is not completely obligatory <laughs> Uh, a complete requirement or an obligation, 
but it does help to practice uh, in this way. And then with boundless calm and this calm or this steadiness of mind, upeka, is very subtle and if we don't have this calm within us, it is hard to practice it boundlessly and to radiate it. Therefore, it's not impossible, but it has some challenges to it. If the mind is not completely calm, it's hard to radiate calm. So, and there is this progression, but still the practice is the same, making it a vehicle, a foundation. And see, this is not just sitting practice. This is all the time practice. And this is learning how to deal with certain situations that are different with this really, really wholesome response to all kinds of situations. So that we are sharpening our tools in our toolbox so that we become simply better human beings. Hopefully. Isn't that what we're all trying to do? And now he starts, because these four Brahma Viharas, these four uplifted uh, abidings of the mind or the heart, they are like a highway to awareness. <laughs> and because the mind becomes so very wholesome by practicing these, it becomes very aware. It becomes very wholesome in all of everyday situations. We have the tools now to respond and develop very powerful awareness from the beginning. And when we have this, we can then, which is also a structure that the Buddha used a lot in his teaching starting with the Brahma Viharas and then when this is cultivated in the right way and they are very strong and we have very wholesome reactions and our awareness is quite good then we have good tools to undertake properly with a happy mind with a joyful mind the satipatthanas, the resting places of awareness. At that time, monk, when this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train, I will meditate, resting awareness upon body, knowing it as only body, intent fully aware and present, letting go of tension and distractions. This is how you should train, monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination, without thinking but with imagination, without thinking nor in imagination, with joy, without joy, with constant delight, with constant calm, then when this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train, I will meditate, resting awareness upon sensations, knowing them as only sensations, intent fully aware and present, letting go of tension and distractions. This is how you should train, monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination, without thinking, but with imagination, without thinking, nor imagination, with joy, without joy, with constant delight, with constant calm. When this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train. I will meditate resting awareness on mind, knowing it as only mind, intent fully aware and present, letting go of tension and distractions. This is how you should train, monk. While you develop and cultivate this meditation, you should develop it with thinking and imagination, without thinking but with imagination without thinking nor imagination, with joy, 
without joy, with constant delight, with constant calm. And this sequence is a sequence that he also mentions in the Upakilesa Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya, number 136, I believe, to Anuruddha. When this meditation has been developed, well developed, you should train, I will meditate, resting awareness upon mental states, knowing them as only mental states, intent, fully aware and present, letting go of tension and distractions. This is how you should train, monk. And now as we've gone through this stock definition of each of the satipatthanas, we might notice a few things that are uh, quite obvious that are coming back. And one of them is being, well, one of them is the first thing that we notice is that it is about knowing whatever this resting place is, whether it's the body, whether it's sensations, whether it's mind or whether it's mental states, the practice is the same and it is about seeing them just as they are. So that means not indulging in them, not blowing them out of proportion, not feeding anything that could arise about them, not taking them personal and kindling any distractions that could arise from them. But rather, it is to let go of any tension and distractions. And that is also one thing that comes every time. And so here, this letting go of tension and distractions is actually right effort, which is embedded in samasati, or wise awareness. And it is embedded in each of them. And these, in fact, come together. This is Vineya Loke Abhija Dhammana Sang. So that means having removed covetousness and I can't remember the classic definition of Dhammanasa. But um, something like displeasure or something. And that means simply abhija is anything that we could cling to, we could uh, label, we could have expectations about or uh, want and anything that we don't want, dominasa. So here I basically uh, translate it as tension and distractions, which is just very practical for our practice here and now. Uh, intent, fully aware and present, which is also another line that comes back uh, every time. And this is atapi sampajanyo satima. And that means When we let go of any hindrance in the mind, the hindrances, they are like clouds. They're like this sludge of the mind that is weighing down the mind. But as we learn to cleanse and let it go with the water of bright awareness and these uplifted states of mind, the mind becomes very clear and atapi is, in fact, it is a metaphor for the heat of the sun or the brightness of the sun. And as we are meditating here, we are like shining. We are bright, <laughs> intent, because we are here content, happy with whatever is. We're not judging. We're not. We're simply happy. And that very bright awareness is atapi. We are intent upon that wonderful, joyous awareness. Sampajanyo. Sampajanya is that full awareness 
That means we're not focusing on one thing. We're not grasping at any aspect of this experience. We are sampajanga. We are fully conscious of what? Of everything that arises. But we're not clinging to it. Therefore, awareness stays sharp and bright. And satima will, of course, is presence, presence of mind. And sati comes from smriti. It is this... In English, we lose this, uh, we, try to, we try to mix Pali, match Pali words with English words, but it doesn't really work so well most of the time, in fact. And uh, we're trying to uh, patchwork this language bridge, but um, sati, in fact, means memory. That is the first uh, meaning of that word. And so, what is this uh, interesting parallel to memory? We are literally, awareness has this flavor in Pali of being constantly remembering, remembering to be that, to be present here, remembering, remembering, remembering not something in particular, but it is that remembering, so that being I you try not to use the word mindfulness because I think the word mind emptiness is actually more accurate <laughs> than mindfulness but um, because the mind is not full <laughs> it's finally it's finally free is finally uh, rid of hindrances, so it's uh, mind empty. And so here the Buddha, uh, after having talked about these four, and this is simply how, as we become more aware of everything, we simply, the common denominator, as I said it, is not clinging is simply letting go constantly. And that is what also the Buddha called anicca sanya, this understanding of impermanence. This, this is when this starts to arise. Because we're not clinging. When we do not cling, we see everything that is passing away. Whether it's the body, sensations, mind, or mental states, it's all just passing away and we're not clinging. And the Buddha ends saying, When all these meditations have been developed, well developed, wherever you go, you will go at ease. Wherever you stand, you will stand at ease. Wherever you sit, you will sit at ease. Wherever you lay down, you will lay down at ease. Then the monk, instructed in such a way by the awakened one, stood up, rightly paid homage to him, and then left. Then the monk, dwelling alone, secluded, attentive, intent, and resolute, in no long time attained to the purpose for which sons of good families honestly leave their home and become homeless seekers, seeking for the highest the complete perfection of the holy life. And having realized the Dhamma by his own direct knowledge, he abided in it. He directly knew rebirth or unwholesome states are vanquished. Lived is the holy life. Done was what should be done. There is no more conceit here. And the monk became another of the Arahants. That is all. And now I will leave it open for questions for, for a little while, if you have any. Yeah. 
Thank you, Bhante. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, this uh, combination of Brahma Viharas with uh, Sati Patana. This is really wonderful. And is it uh, also in uh, many other suttas or only this one? Yes, it is in quite quite a few suttas. Um, you mean together, like this? Yeah, yeah. This, mm. is, this sutta has both, you know, put together, and the progression is uh, well uh, delineated. Yes. Well, this is a fairly unique sutta, I must say. This it is quite explicit in that way. And I do not know of many more suttas that are like this. But there are some suttas. The thing is that it tends to be a little misunderstood. So there are actually a lot of suttas that are quite clear like this. But since we uh, understanding is not completely clear about certain things, then it looks like just uh, a normal sutta maybe, but uh, these two practices were very, very, um, in fact, um, very common uh, together. And for example, in this, uh, the advice to Rahula uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha would tell his son to basically... Uh, because Sariputta tells Rahula to practice awareness of breathing. And then Rahula goes to the Buddha and asks, uh, Bhante, how is mindfulness of breathing uh, developed? So it, is, it bears great fruit and is of great benefit. And the Buddha actually does not explain to him right away what Anapanasati is. He starts with telling him, first... You should meditate like the elements, like the earth, the water, the fire, uh, and the air. Because the elements, they don't, things, they don't take things personal. So they don't react to things uh, when they happen. We, they just see things as they are. Like the water doesn't get offended when somebody uh, spits in it. That's what he says. Or something like that. Or throws some dirty things on it or this, the earth is the same the air is the same fire is the same so that is just to settle his mind because he's a young boy he he's the youngest of the sangha members and he's being taught his beginning beginnings in meditation then the buddha says rahula you should then develop boundless love or metta metta bhavana then he says, then you should develop a mind of compassion, boundless compassion, karuna bhavana. Then you should cultivate a mind of boundless joy, mudita bhavana. And then he says, upekka bhavana. You should develop a mind of boundless calm. And then he says, then Rahula, you can practice awareness of breathing. And then he explains awareness, anapanasati. And if we know the suttas very well, we know that the anapanasati sutta, the Buddha explains the anapanasati. First, he gives the 16 steps. Of course, the four blocks of anapanasati. But these four blocks, he also later in that very sutta, uh, on Anapanasati Sutta 118 Majjhima Nikaya. He explains the first block as awareness of body, the second block as awareness of sensations, the third block as mind, and the third block as dhammas, as mental states. And so here, obviously, it is not clearly said, uh, the, the Satipatthanas are not clearly mentioned, but when we, we actually know how this Anapanasati was taught, it was taught like this is the way to develop 
the four satipatthanas, then we understand that the Buddha, in fact, every time the Buddha mentions awareness of breathing, he talks about the four satipatthanas directly. Therefore, in that sutta specifically, um, he really quite clearly uh, explains this whole process again, but we need to understand what is anapanasati. So that is one other that I can think of, just like this. <laughs> Good. Another question that uh, I had was uh, uh, in this sutta also uh, uh, he clearly says that you let go of the object of the meditation that you start with. So it's not uh, that you persist with the same object throughout the mental development or the meditation. So you move on to finally to uh, calmness and then uh, further to uh, the resting places of awareness. Yes. And this is also, um, if we practice the Brahma Viharas, if we practice the, the sublime attitudes, or however we want to call them, we, the Buddha in many, many discourses, uh, in fact, he said, he directly said, the Brahma Viharas, they are the way to Brahma, but they are not the way to Nibbana. <laughs> One cannot attain Nibbana using the Brahma Viharas because there is still something. Whether it, there is that concept, whether it's in the finest, we have uh, this example in this. Uh, Metta Sahagata is this uh, sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, where he explains the limit of each of the Brahma Viharas. And the love, the metta, is the beautiful, the fourth jhana. Then compassion is the, uh, and the limit of compassion is endless space, the first arupa jhana. Then the limit of boundless joy is in the space of the plane of um, endless consciousness and the limit of boundless calm or upeka is the plane that I call bare awareness or nothingness. And from then on, if we want to go further in meditation, because even at the level of bare awareness, and this is why I um, this is why I call it bare awareness to leave the traditional um, the, uh, translation of nothingness, because akinchana is also it's like this rid of possessions, and it is that awareness that is rid of any. Um, any other object or any, it is uncoupled. So it is this really bare awareness and that's really that experience. We can call it nothing, nothingness also, but then I find this creates problems sometimes because then there's endless spaciousness and then, there, and then there's cessation and then plane of nothingness, then it creates sometimes some, <laughs> some misunderstandings where people are. But that bare awareness is that there is this really sharp awareness of nothing. <laughs> and so at that point, we can't bring the Brahma Viharas further. That would, that would mean basically lowering the mind to a coarser state. So at that point, inevitably, it has to be the Satipatthanas. So, and not really the body, because now we've gone beyond the body. We've gone in the arupa. Body might be there sometimes in the background. It might arise a little bit, 
we feel something, but mind is not interested in knowing this. So, and since we practice the the letting go all the time as we practice the satipatthanas, the mind won't won't be interested in being weighed down by this coarse awareness of body. So we will simply uh, remain with either we have a sen mental a sensation that arises, whatever it is, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, or whether it's simply knowing this, the general state of the mind, but usually it will end with uh, seeing Dhamma as Dhamma. If there is a slight little movement in the mind, we will see it as restlessness. We will see it simply as movement in the mind. And at that point, we see very clearly the very beginning of any mental activity, any sankara. And it simply becomes the natural resting place of the mind because it has become so free. It's completely... Um, open. And so as soon as it starts to narrow down and focus on one thing or one particular idea, we will start to see that tension arising. And if we generate the intention, for example, even a, of radiating calm, for example, there is a place where just it, even this is too coarse. Just generating that intention is narrowing down the mind and it feels like tension. So we leave it completely open. And this is where these, this knowing mind as mind and knowing uh, Dhamma as Dhamma is very... It's like the last vehicle of the mind before we leave all vehicles behind. And... Well, Niroda is just this place where it's it says it in itself. There is there is no no more of of anything. So there is no more uh, the mirror. We've polished the mirror of our awareness so clearly that it it's like it disappears. So we we can't even see a speck in there, and then. Uh, as we let go, because release, in the end, release truly becomes all of this meditation. It all ends with simply just letting it all go at this point. And release becomes the vehicle of our meditation. In one sutta, the Buddha called that uh, Vosaga Aramana, making relaxation or letting go our foundation for jhana and this is whenever we are aware of something at that point whatever it is it is one of these things it is one of these satipatthanas and if we don't hold on to it if we don't grasp on it we are practicing we are letting go and that is the Satipatthana practice. I think, good. I think Mel may had a question. Uh, yes, thank you, Bhante. Um, I just have a question out of curiosity, uh, more than anything. Um, the word Dormanasa, which Bhante explained just now, um, I'm, I'm guessing that's the word Bhikkhu Bodhi always translated as um, grief. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering whether the word, just like what Bhante said, does, does it mean like any unpleasant mental state, basically everything that the mind sees as unpleasant? Is that, co is that a correct way of understanding? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, it's do, uh, technically, this, to break it down, it is do, and that means, like, it is the same root as dukkha, do, and then manasa is simply that, that mind, that 
mental state that is unpleasant, that grief. And so manasa, the opposite, I call it ease of mind or uh, sometimes grace, but depending. It's, uh, I, I simply, uh, the Buddha had so many ways of, um, in fact, explaining this. And in the, in the meditation, in the guided meditation, I, in fact, I was, um, I was basically uh, leading this meditation, uh, reading the Satipatthana Sutta. <laughs> so... Uh, what you heard during this um, sitting meditation mostly was from the Satipatthana Sutta, the Maha Satipatthana. And uh, in that Sutta, he calls it uh, a mind that has desire in it, which is uh, uh, Saraga. And uh, Vittaraga is a mind without desire. So knowing this, and knowing that, and abhija is just another word that the Buddha used for desires. Something like Buddha, the B Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi says, uh, covetousness. It's uh, it's it's valid, and it's um, that's why I call it tension because it's that grasping. And <laughs> I like to use the word tension because it's very practical for us here and now. Um, and uh, for example, this, this is the hindrance of kama chanda, so sen sense desire. So all these words meaning fairly closely the same thing. Like he would say uh, sadosa or vita dosa. Uh, for uh, with uh, anger or without anger and um, this would be vyapada or vyapada in in the hindrances and that is also domanasa so these are all words uh, pointing to the same principles Okay, good, so maybe we can share some merits. Dukkha patta chani dukkha, bhaya patta chani bhaya, soka patta chani soka, hondi sabbe pipani no. Idang no punyang sabbe satta no mo dan tu sabba sampati siddhya aka satta cha bhumatta deva naga mahidika punyang tangam no mo ditwa chirang rakantu buddha sasasanang May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha-sasana. Sadhu, sadhu.